Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, a member of Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and ICAD USA. Uh, Co sponsors. And I'll give you a second to take a look at them. We're really grateful for the support of our co-sponsors and we appreciate uh, their help in, uh, in promoting uh, the uh, interview with Phil. This is the last of our four-part commemoration of the Nakba at 75, the ongoing Palestinian catastrophe. Today, we welcome investigative journalist, Phil Weiss. Phil is the co-founder and senior editor of the must-read daily online news source, mondaweiss.net, a news and commentary website that's highly sympathetic to the Palestinian view and which fosters greater fairness for Palestinians in American foreign policy. Phil has written for New York Magazine, Harper's, Esquire, and uh, many others. So, Phil, welcome. You're going to thank you, go. you, Michael. Thanks very much. My pleasure. It's good to see you. Well, I, I want to just jump right into things, if you don't mind, Phil. Sure. Um, today is uh, was in Jerusalem, Jerusalem Day or Flag Day. Uh, ostensibly celebrating the capture of East Jerusalem in 67, what the Israeli government calls the reunification of Jerusalem. Rabid, rabid Israeli Jews marched out uh, through the Damascus Gate in the Muslim quarter of the old city. And in a nationalist display uh, over Palestinians in the city, shops vandalized, racist chants, humiliations, and violence occurs. And of course, the, the toothless and servile Biden administration has, quote, urged calm on both sides. On the other hand, I, I've been in touch with Jewish refusenik Sahar Vardi uh, earlier today, who's part of a Jewish-Israeli counter demonstration in Jerusalem. Your thoughts, uh, Phil, uh, on this uh, day, Flag Day, as a window into the Zionist apartheid uh, agenda. Um, well, thank you. I think it's a it's um, sobering and important that you bring that up first. Uh, it is it's a tragic day because uh, uh, there are hundreds, even thousands of racists chanting "Death to the Arabs" and uh, walking through a, a Palestinian neighborhood, and um, it's uh, licensed by the Israeli government. Uh, it tries to tamp it down, but it will not cancel this uh, uh, sort of uh, horrific celebration. It reminds me of Charlottesville, you know, a, a few years ago, that um, uh, where, which Trump encouraged and which uh, any liberal in America was horrified by. And um, I think it's also wise of you to uh, raise the Biden administration's toothless, toothless response. Um, it's especially uh, concerning when you consider that the Biden administration boycotted the Nakba celebration, commemoration at the UN, United Nations, the other day. And I think uh, deplored the fact that the United Nations was holding a Nakba uh, commemoration. The Nakba, of course, being the uh, Palestinian catastrophe in which um, 750,000, I'm not sure the exact number, some say 800,000 Palestinians were expelled or fled from uh, as during Israel's creation. And um, um, most importantly, were not allowed to return to their homes. Uh, so uh, historical fact, um, not uh, that dissimilar from other uh, uh, historical tragedies that we commemorate from the uh, Tulsa massacre that we hear so much about now in American um, news to the Holocaust 
to uh, the Civil War, slavery. Uh, the Nakba is a, a great blot on, uh, on, on world history. And the fact that the United States can't even acknowledge it is, is very sad. I've been saying, and you know, I try to I try to simplify things as I go and talk at churches, but in in town here, that's mostly my the venues that uh, where I'm invited. But I've been saying that Zionism is to Judaism as Christian nationalism is to Christianity. Zionism is as racist and exceptionalist as Christian nationalism is. Is that fair? What are your thoughts? Well, uh... I it's it's a little hard for me to reflect on Christian nationalism because I'm not that familiar with it. Um, when what uh, as I, I don't have a, a, a waterfront view of it, certainly manifestations of Christian nationalism that I've seen in our country in recent years, I find uh, 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 scary and um, demoralizing, devastating. I can say that from my standpoint as an American Jew, um, and someone who studied Zionism, uh, I think it's a, a inherently racist ideology. Um, it may not have started out that way. It may have had idealistic components. It, uh, I can imagine that I would have been a Zionist 100 years ago, uh, as many in uh, Eastern Europe were Zionists. Um, it was then considered a liberation, uh, an ideology of liberation from uh, persecution in Eastern Europe. Um, so it, 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 I understand it's an understandable impulse uh, Zionism was uh, or adherence to Zionism was, but um, it's very clear that Zionism has worked out to be uh, a, essentially Jewish supremacy, um, not just Jewish nationalism, uh, I mean, which is bad enough, but Jewish supremacy, apartheid, persecution, racism, indifference to the suffering of Palestinians. And uh, I think that that is pretty true uh, almost across the board in Israel when you look at Zionists. There are some liberal Zionists on the fringe who can uh, be anti-occupation and support Palestinian rights, but even that's limited and there are very few of them. And broadly speaking, even liberals who are Zionists in, in, uh, in Israel uh, including the hundreds of thousands who have turned out to uh, save Israeli quote unquote democracy in recent months from Netanyahu, they cannot look at Palestinian rights and cannot look at the Palestinian uh, uh, oppression, which um, if Zionism was an answer to oppression in Eastern Europe, it, it's, it's complete failure shows that it is in, it, it's indifference to and fostering of Palestinian, Palestinian persecution. Now, I'm going to later on, I'm going to ask you about liberal Zionism in, in the United States. So uh, hold your thought on that. But uh, <clears throat> I'm, you brought up a couple of things I want to follow up with uh, this past Sunday. In your Mondo Weiss Weekly brief, uh, Briefing, you titled your uh, uh, op-ed, 75 Years of Commemorating the Nakba and One for Shireen Abu Akhla. Uh, and you recounted a number of recent events, some tragic and deadly, uh, some hopeful, which you covered, which Mondo Weiss covered. And I want to ask you about each one separately. Um, one week ago, the one year anniversary of the targeted killing of uh, Palestinian American Shireen Abu Akleh. And, you know, in addition to the bombings and the killings of Palestinians every day, one, two, three or more, there's also, and you're a journalist, so I'm interested particularly in your take on this, there is also an assault on Palestinian cultural leaders, uh, leaders of the arts, and particularly Palestinian journalists and other members of the foreign press. Talk to us about Shireen and what that killing and the targeting of Palestinian journalists means. Thank you, Michael. And I'll try to uh, be short in my answers so that we have a lot of room for questions and for discussion. Um, I, I, I don't wanna be tedious. Um, so as you observed uh, uh, on, on May 11th of 2022, Israeli forces killed Shireen Abu Akleh, a leading journalist and a, a 
um, uh, in the Palestinian community. Uh, she worked for Al, Al Jazeera as a broadcast journalist, and um, she was an American citizen as well as a Palestinian. And the United States has done precious little to um, uh, for any accountability in, Sh in Shireen's targeted killing. I mean, someone was shoot firing at her, um, a sniper from 600 feet or so in Janine. Um, I think that um, if I might just select a portion of your question um, to answer it, to keep it short, um, I think the significance, one, uh, apart from the dismal record of the United States in the case uh, for standing up for press freedom, I think that one of the great things that has happened last week uh, and the last week was, A, there was a, um, today there was a, uh, several Congress people stood outside the Capitol and demanded accountability for Shireen's death. And we will talk about the block that exists in Congress that supports Palestinian rights and has never existed like this before, which is a wonderful development. I'm a very optimistic person. Michael, I know uh, from our discussions that you also are a hopeful person. And that is a great thing we'll, we'll get to. Another thing we will. is that yeah, we will. Uh, a second factor uh, uh, as development is that the Committee to Protect Journalists published a report last week on uh, eight, uh, uh, commemorating Shireen's death and pointing out that there were 18 other killings of Palestinian journalists over the last 20 years, and no Israeli soldier has ever been charged with any of those killings. Now, one right. can ask, where was this committee to protect journalists during Yasser Murtaha's killing in, uh, I, I think it deplored Yasser Murtaha's killing in um, Gaza. Uh, five years ago. But there have been many killings that have not been called out by human rights groups before. The fact that Committee to Protect Journalists is is uh, is being insistent about this is great news and is an indication of the fact that human rights groups around the world are getting fed up with Israel's lies and propaganda about its human rights abuses. And so that is, um, I mean, it's a horrible thing to have to say, but we 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 can say that Shireen's death was we was the, the, that some good will come of Shireen's death, and it has certainly electrified uh, a conscious. It, she has raised consciousness around the world. You mentioned uh, you mentioned hopeful signs in uh, um, Congress. Uh, one of the things that you pointed out in this article on Sunday. Uh, about the 75 years commemorating the Nakba was about Michigan Congressional Representative Rashida Tlaib barred by House Speaker Kevin McCarthy uh, for holding a Nakba, Nakba commemoration, but then given uh, space by Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, um, our friend Tom Russell, Thomas Russell asks, so I want you to talk about that, but then also- sure. How do we take back our political parties from the dominance of Zionism, Christian and Jewish versions? So if you can kind of blend those answers together, sure. that would be helpful. Uh, so first, I'd just like to say that I am i don't consider myself an expert on Christian Zionism. I, I know that it's certainly something I track, um, and it's uh, very important in the Republican Party that I don't think that Christian Zionism is the reason that Donald Trump bent over backwards for Israel for four years and did everything Israel wanted him to do, Netanyahu wanted him to do. I think that has to do with the uh, the Jewish branch of the Israel lobby in the United States, and in that case, Sheldon Adelson. Um, uh, so uh, when it comes to Congress, uh, I think that what's crucial is that um, and, and the Democratic and Republican parties, I think that what, again, being hopeful, and uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm a broken record on this, but um, we can see ways in which um, the Democratic Party, which has been in thrall and still is the leadership, is in thrall, in my view, to the Israel lobby on from the Jewish community. Uh, and um, the, the dismal 
record of the Biden administration on these issues reflects Biden's concern about the 2024 election and keeping the Israel lobby on his side, not letting it go over to DeSantis, who's making a play for it, or Trump will make a play for it. Anyway, notwithstanding the fact that the Democratic leadership is, in my belief, bought and sold uh, by, the, by the Israel lobby, we are seeing very positive developments inside the Democratic Party. And the, the real cause of that, um, I think, is the movement of which you are a part. The great sponsors you uh, noted at the start of this discussion have all played a part in raising consciousness. There has been an, a, a hugely important grassroots movement in America for Palestinian human rights. And that movement has been indifferent to the mainstream media, has been indifferent to the uh, political establishment. It has said, we're gonna do this. We don't care what you call us. You can call us anti-Semites. You can uh, say that, um, uh, penalize us for supporting BDS, but we are going to stand up for Palestinian rights. And it has had an enormous effect. And I think that um, just to focus on the positive, uh, two factors uh, here, and I because uh, I don't want to go on too long, but um, in that block of uh, of Congress people who now stand up for Palestinian rights today outside the Capitol for Shireen Abu Akhla, you saw Betty McCollum and uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, both uh, enormously uh, appealing politicians, charismatic politicians who are able to articulate. Uh, the, the cause of Palestinian human rights in um, vivid and uh, ways that appeal to, to uh, I think, a mass audience. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful people, wonderful help politicians. To bring stuff in. And we, we haven't seen that before. We haven't seen such voices in the Congress. We have seen them, but they've always been cut down by the Israel lobby in the past. And the Israel lobby has not been able to cut down Rashida, has not been able to cut down Betty McCollum, or for that matter, Elon Omar, also from Minnesota. But I, I think, so that's an important factor that the, uh, there's a, 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 the, um, you'll excuse the expression, but the camel has got its nose under the, under the tent and we're inside now and uh, we are never going back. And this block will grow. It will grow slowly. It was it added Summer Lee from Pittsburgh last year, who even liberal Zionists endorsed Summer Lee. And Summer Lee waffled a little bit on BDS in Israel in the election, but has come out since then for accountability for Israeli uh, human rights abuses. The second factor I want to raise, uh, which will come to, uh, which I think will be a, a theme of this discussion, is. The grassroots. I, I referenced all the great work your organization has done, other organizations have done, but they have changed attitudes. And we see inside the Democratic Party today strong attitudes in favor of Palestinian rights. It's kind of shocking. It's a revolution inside the Democratic Party. And I say this just with joy that when you think that in 2016, 53%, over half of the Democratic voters, were more sympathetic, were sympathetic to Israel, only 23 sympathetic to Palestine. That's in 2016, seven years ago, uh, double the number uh, were sympathetic to Israel over Palestine after many is Israeli massacres uh, uh, in preceding years and um, the siege of Gaza and uh, un unbridled settlement growth, still 53 to 23. And Obama trying to raise consciousness 50 uh, somewhat, on Palestinian rights, 53 of Democrats supported uh, for were for Palestinian uh, Israeli sympathized with Israeli. 53 percent, 23 percent with Palestine. The numbers have flipped. Switched now. They have flipped, and I, I must insist that's kind of the most important news. That it's not news. It's been out for a few weeks, but this is really the most important development that politicians are all reckoning with too at some level. But now. 49% of Democrats sympathize with Palestinians, 38% with Israelis. Now it's not a complete flip, but now we are first time seeing a majority of uh, 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 plurality of um, Democratic voters who, who are more sympathetic to um, Palestinians in Israel. And the politicians are feeling this, the progressives are feeling it, and 
we even have, uh, I think that 44% um, of Dems say that Israel is practicing segregation akin to apartheid. So these attitudes, which we have fostered, we can clap ourselves on the back. We can thank ourselves, uh, th uh, th congratulate ourselves, and thank our sister organizations for all the work we've done to change these attitudes by raising consciousness, consciousness by pointing at the facts. So sorry to go on so long, Michael. No, but but no powerful, Phil, thank you. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, even in red state Indiana, where I live uh, in Indianapolis, of course, uh, one of the handful of Muslim uh, congressman, Andre Carson, is also on the side of the angels. Uh, I'm, with and, so. I'm sorry. Thank you for bringing that up. Forgive me we've for hosted, interrupting. We've hosted but, Andre here in Fort Wayne. And so uh, that's great. And Andre was outside the Capitol today with uh, the Shireen Abu Akhle's family, with Betty McCollum, Ilan Omar, and uh, Rashida Tlaib. So props to uh, Andre Carson. Uh, you also included uh, in your uh, weekly briefing uh, the uh, assault on Gaza, uh, and uh, we can't we can't not talk about Gaza uh, with you, Phil. Uh, what is it about Israel's continued assaults on Gaza? Right, embargo, limited fishing, borders closed, limited calories allowed per inhabitant. Uh, bombings every number of months, targeted educational uh, energy and medical buildings, and more. You know, Michael, uh, I, this answer will be a little bit short, but I have to say uh, you itemized it very well. I just have to say that I, uh, again, I'm I'm a Jewish American, and I um, uh, grew up being learning uh, uh, the, the sorrowful history of Jews in Europe. That was my family culture, was to focus on what had happened to us in Europe. Our relatives, whom uh, we didn't even know by name, who were uh, 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 killed in the Holocaust. And uh, my mother made it a point when um, Roman Vishniak's book of uh, photographs from the Warsaw Ghetto was published in the 60s, a big coffee table size book, of documenting the Warsaw Ghetto in ways that had not been done before. She bought six copies of that, one for each of her children. And my mother never bought new books. So it was very remarkable. I bring this all up to say, I've been to Gaza. And I, my only answer to you is that it, is, it, it reminds me of the Warsaw Ghetto. The, the degree of isolation, of de dehumanization, of uh, oppression, of persecution is reminiscent of that period of Polish history um, when the Nazis had occupied um, a Poland. And uh, I'm not saying that it uh, ended in, that, that Gaza ends in Treblinka and Auschwitz as the Warsaw Ghetto did when it was emptied. But before it was emptied, it was a site of terrible oppression and terrible persecution and uh, merely for raising an alarm when soldiers came near, you could be killed. That happens in Gaza that, um, and in the occupied West Bank, merely for raising an alarm when commando, Israeli occupying commandos are coming through, you can be killed. And that happened in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, the, the, not, the Gestapo would come into the ghetto and uh, someone would whistle or signal to the a family to, to, that they were coming and they would be killed on the spot. So I, these things for me are just totally resonant of uh, a very Jewish experience, historical experience. And I think that the worst of Israel from my standpoint is the ways that it is, uh, has it internalized the um, uh, trauma of the Holocaust, intergenerational trauma of the Holocaust, and is now uh, perpetrating that on another people, portions of the Holocaust. I have, a, I have some other questions, but just the, the way you answered that, that question, Phil, um, the West Bank, it might be appropriate for you to say a little bit more about the West Bank and particularly Gaza as sort of a, a controlled environment for the testing of American-made, Israeli-bought uh, weapons, you know, battle-tested, field-tested so then Israel can sell them to any number of countries abroad, right? Uh, uh, 
Um, so yeah, Gaza is this controlled environment for the testing of weapons. Michael, I'd, I'd like you to expand on that. It's I, I, I'm aware that's true. It's just not an area of my expertise, but uh, I, I know Jeff Halper is focused on that. If you wanted to say more, I'd be very curious. Well, I know Jewish Voice for Peace, right, uh, uh, has uh, um, a number of initiatives that focus on this, particularly with uh, with uh, uh, police forces and other security forces around the U.S. being trained, right? Yes. Yeah. Deadly exchange, they call it. And so if people are interested uh, in learning more about this uh, Jewish Voice for Peace deadly exchange, and I know any number of you folks on the uh, on the screen are experts, m much more expert about this than I am. But uh, um, I think it's it was worth pointing out at least. Yes, definitely. And I, I don't want to waste your time by offering my thoughts on that, where I'm just not as well informed. I'm aware of the deadly exchange. Um, project, which has been fantastic. Bill, I, you've shared this in many other venues, but for us here, you, you started uh, uh, sharing a little bit about your own personal story. Can you tell us a little bit more about just your evolution? Uh, what led you to this place where you're an activist uh, working for full Palestinian civil, political, and human rights? Sure. Look at your biography, you know, that, sure. that did you hear. Sure. I love to talk about myself. Who doesn't? But uh, <laughs> So I'll try to keep it short. But um, I should say that, um, excuse me, I come from a very, uh, from an academic Jewish family that's not very religious, but culturally is very Jewish. So when I was growing up, my mother, as I said, had six kids. She even said once, I had one for each million that was lost in Europe. So she was a little bit, uh, she could be a little bit nutty about the Holocaust, my mother. Um, or, 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 or she was traumatized by the Holocaust, even though she had grown up in the United States. And um, so, I, and was born here too, I, daughter of immigrants. I, I think that what's important in my case is that I was, um, I had very little knowledge of Zionism given my sort of academic family. And when I was bar mitzvahed in 1968 in uh, Baltimore, they gave me Zionist literature at my bar mitzvah, the synagogue did, but I didn't, didn't really mean that much to me. And similarly, when the uh, 67 war happened in which Israel um, uh, wiped out these uh, air forces on the first day, and it was a war of aggression by Israel, but Israel, it was celebrated by American Jews. I remember my best friend running up to me in uh, elementary school and saying, did you hear we wiped out the, you know, the Air Force? And it kind of washed over me. I didn't understand then, um, as, as Lyndon Johnson, by the way, also did not understand. I did not understand how I could be so against the Vietnam War uh, in my Jewish community and my liberal community and for this other war. And um, Lyndon Johnson made that observation when he said, you know, they want me to send the Sixth Fleet to the Mediterranean for Israel. They won't buy a screwdriver for me in Vietnam. So uh, meaning the Jewish community. When I got to college, it's interesting. I remember uh, someone saying that Israel was expansionist. And so as a young man, I was 19 then, I heard that Israel was expansionist and the settlements were already beginning. And this was the 70s. And I remember saying something to a neoconservative friend about this. And he said, you should not get engaged in this issue. We were you know, 19 and 20 years old. He said, you should not be engaged until you know what the Balfour Declaration is, what Transjordan is, all this other kind of, he gave me a literacy test when I was 19 saying, you're Jewish, don't get involved. He was the son of Holocaust survivors. And I bring that episode up to say that <laughs> This guy went on to become a famous neoconservative intellectual and uh, who had major influence. And he, he, he helped to propagandize uh, Menachem Begin as a wonderful prime minister to the American Jewish community. I bring it up to say that I accepted that uh, <clears throat> sort of omerta, that code of silence when I was 20. You, you, he said, you don't, you can't, yeah, I know you're a liberal, don't engage on this question until you've studied everything. Well, I hadn't studied everything about Vietnam, but I was allowed to be against that. Uh, 
And I hadn't studied everything about Israel, but I couldn't get engaged in that. And I, what my shame is that it wasn't until I was 50 years old that I finally went to Israel, that after the, it was the Iraq war that kind of pulled the control rods out of my, uh, um, my nuclear core on this. Uh, the Iraq war happened and um, uh, my brother said to me, um, hey, uh, what do you think of this war? And I said, it's terrible. What do you think? It's, I, I, what do you mean to what do I think? It's terrible. I've been in the streets demonstrating against it. And he said, um, well, uh, we both demonstrated against the Vietnam War, but my Jewish newspaper says this war could be good for Israel. And I, this was 2002 or three. I was shocked. That, that's kind of the uh, most important moment in the history of my, in my personal autobiography on writing about this question. At two, in 2003, I realized that the Jewish community was supporting the Iraq war uh, in large measure. Um, it was because of, the, uh, of Zionism. And I thought that I could no longer uh, ignore this question and I threw myself into it. And I uh, went to Israel. Uh, I began to um, examine the role of Zionism and militarism and <laughs> the uh, effect on American policy because uh, I, I think the tail did wag the dog in the Iraq war. And um, I first went to Israel when I was 50 years old in 2006. And that summer, uh, well, just to conclude, I don't want to go on much longer. <clears throat> I saw, uh, I was in the West Bank and a Palestinian said to me, uh, uh, excuse me, South African I met there at a Palestinian's house said, this is worse than what we had in, under apartheid. And I came back to the newspaper I was working for, which was owned then by Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law. And I said, hey, I'm writing this, you know, I, it's worse than apartheid. And I, within a year, I'd been fired by that newspaper where I'd worked for several years at Dear Friends. Um, so I was, and, but then my blog had begun by then uh, that turned into Mondo Weiss. But so it was a slow process. I'm sorry to go on so long, but you made the mistake of asking me about myself. So thanks, Michael. I, no, I, I, we appreciate, I think we all appreciate uh, just your evolution. I mean, we all, many of us have had to make of course. this kind of evolution in our own context. And so it's yes. helped. Yeah, I don't mean, I, let me just say, let me echo you, I echo you there. Every Everyone I've met in this community, in this activist community, uh, today is different, but everyone I've met has had an ordeal, and everyone has had a personal struggle of uh, coming out on this question. Everyone has had some experience of walking a few steps in Palestinian shoes, and once you have walked a few steps in Palestinian shoes, then you uh, have a responsibility to bear witness. I think countless people who are on this call or will hear that, will that will resonate. We are all bearing witness to a remarkable human uh, historical experience. This, we're still in the shadows of the 75th anniversary of the Nakba. I wanna focus on uh, the press. Uh, uh, you're, you're, a mem you're a journalist, a member of the press. Uh, on Monday, you focused in your uh, article on praising uh, at least parts of NPR and MSNBC's and Vox's coverage, he called it a high watermark. Now, there's still a, a lot to criticize, right, about the media's coverage of Palestine, more than enough to criticize. But there are signs of light and hope. At M MSNBC, there's Mehdi Hassan, Ali Belshi, and then you you referenced uh, Eamon Moheldine, who interviewed uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib over the weekend. So you want to say a word about um, Israel and media coverage and if if it's changing, how it's changing? Yeah, I, thank you, Michael. I think that um, I, you know, there's certain revolutionaries who are guilty of predicting nine. There's an, an old joke about this. They predicted 10 of the last one revolutions, you know, <laughs> so they're the, the kind of person like me who's runs down the street saying, oh, it's changed. We've changed everything. You know, and I, I felt that way. I remember when um, Walton Mearsheimer's paper on the Israel lobby came out in 2006. 
I just started writing. I have to tell this story, sorry. And I read that paper, which was staggering to so many of us. And I said, it's high noon for the Israel lobby. And what I didn't understand was that it was high midnight for the Israel lobby. And uh, we'd have to wait another 12 hours. So I, 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 I say that just to, to make it clear, I'm an enthusiast. But that being the case, I think that we have entered uh, a, an improbable uh, new period in uh, the American discourse because the Nakba at 75 got incredible amount of attention, I think, given what I, I, I anticipated. I would not have anticipated the degree of attention it's gotten. And I think it took Zionists by surprise. It embarrassed Zionists and uh, caused a uh, wave of um, hateful reaction from the Zionist community. But um, I can't really, I, 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 beyond the articles, the, the coverage you mentioned on NPR and MSNBC, I gather that NBC also covered uh, the Nakba commemoration at the UN, which was very moving. So, and, and just the fact that Rashida Tlaib got a Nakba commemoration with a jammed room at the Capitol. I mean, it's just kind of one, one's heart overflows with joy. I, I, mine does at this, you know, it, it's sort of like, uh, uh, I, I just, I, it just reminds me of um, the, 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 the belief in my family. And I I'm sure it was true when I was a child, I'd have never studied this, but that the Holocaust there was embarrassment or it was covered up, it wasn't dealt with. Um, and then it was commemorated. It, it started to be commemorated. I think that we're seeing with the Nakba the, the beginning of waves of commemoration. And I, 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 that's very hopeful on my part, but we are in a new period. And again, I, I think that we have to look at the causes and I go back to, it's Israel's behavior that is the main cause, but I go back to that Gallup poll saying Democrats have flipped. Um, and so the audiences for these uh, magazines and uh, these broadcasts and newspapers, magazines, <clears throat> the audience is hip. They know what's going on. They think it's apartheid over there and they are gonna demand coverage uh, in their ways. So that's my view. Again, sorry to ramble. No, you, you mentioned Walton Mearsheimer. Uh, you know, they said that among other things, the Israel lobby uh, uh, acted, acts and exists to protect Israel in the media, in the press, and um, and they have, they have. Uh, well, true. let's uh, um, let let's talk uh, let's talk apartheid. Okay. That that, that kind of discourse has really captured uh, uh, the attention of the activist community, right? Yesh Dean, yes. Betzalem, Human Rights. I don't have Amnesty International. All yes. have called Israel an apartheid state. This is. This is really, I hate to call Great it progress, news. but it's, but you, I mean, this is an important development. Yeah. Uh, so just, just in the 20 something years I've been involved in this struggle, we've gone from conflict to occupation to apartheid and ethnic cleansing and settler colonial, uh, settler. Great colonial. observation. Yeah. Uh, that should empower us, right? I mean, we, we, we need to, we can't be shy anymore in the way we frame what's happening in Israel and Palestine as an activist community. I agree with you, Michael. I agree. And I, I, I'm just curious, turn it back on you for a second. So you um, have you, you personally went through those phases of, of, of using those words and then seeing how they had been adopted and, and, and helped transform the discussion over 20 years? Yeah, I mean, for sure. And of course, uh, you know, I'm, you know, many of us, uh, many of us aren't uh, put together psychologically, emotionally to be prophets, right? Many of us are pleasers, you know, we want to get along, especially on, on the left. Yes. So it really, there's a conscientization, to use Paulo Freire's words, right, process that needs to take place among activists to use the kind of, I mean, this yes. is, this is legally accurate. Yes. It's politically accurate. I mean, this this is what it is, yes. and so um, what what empowers me is seeing the faces of my Palestinian friends in Palestine and here in the U.S. And so I guess I'm just in. I, I want your take on yes, certainly framing this in in realistic ways 
as yeah. we talk to, to groups. Well, it's interesting what you say. I mean, um, I, I would observe just by the way that, you know, years ago, you know, I came back in 2006, as I say, and I got into the New York Observer that it was apartheid, you know, and that was in 2006, I said that. And part of it was, I was so shocked by what I had seen, you know, it was shocking. It, and, and, and anyone who's been there, as Noam Chomsky says, it's worse than apartheid. You know, if you've been there, you know, it's worse than apartheid. You know, this uh, South African said to me, we didn't have a pass system on the roads in uh, apartheid South Africa. Um, so he made other observations that I now forget, I apologize. But the point I'm getting at is that I used this verboten word in 2006, and Jimmy Carter also made that mistake in the title of his book. And Jimmy Carter was ostracized from the Democratic Party, and Jimmy Carter was paddled by um, <clears throat> Wolf Blitzer uh, for doing so, and uh, also by Terry Gross on uh, Fresh Air on NPR. Um, how could you use this word? And I remember people telling me later, Bill, I think it's better to say Jim Crow uh, uh, Palestine. So I would use Jim Crow sometimes. And at the time uh, in this period in the 2010s around 20 teens, I remember a US campaign for Palestinian rights said, we're saying apartheid. This is apartheid, we are gonna call a spade a spade. And I remember, um, uh, and, and that was very, uh, it, it, they, they certainly, help mobilize the activist community on that. And I would be saying Jim Crow to make myself a little more user friendly, as you say that uh, to the left wing community that we were part of, but you don't have to do that anymore. That's the great thing. We have made progress. And you know, if you consider that um, again, 44% of Democrats, according to University of Maryland poll, recently last month say it's segregation that amounts to apartheid. We really, achieved that consciousness raising on this point. And of course, we've done it with the help of Israel, which has been completely unregenerate, uh, has only doubled down again and again on apartheid policies. It has not tried to uh, uh, thwart us by coming up with some, you know, uh, liberal uh, phrasing or liberal policies. No, they've adopted a nation state law in 2018 that says, exclusive right of self-determination in this land belongs to Jews. And Arabic is a lesser language <coughs> than Hebrew. Horribly a discriminatory uh, apartheid uh, legislation. So uh, sorry to go on again, but I, I hope that answers your question. I think that, 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 that oh, and I, the last point I'd make is on MSNBC the other day, they were using the phrase, uh, Ayman Moyadin used the expression ethnic cleansing to describe the Nakba. So we've made a lot of progress. You wrote uh, uh, in Mondawais after the latest Israeli elections that quote, the American Jewish war over Zionism can begin. Zionism destroys everything in its path. It's corrupted every major American Jewish organization. And to pick up on what you were just saying, and Netanyahu's return allows American Jews to acknowledge this. So this latest government has even provoked liberal Zionists as have pushed them beyond the brink in some cases. Yes. So the American Jewish war over Zionism can begin. Tell us more about that. Well, um, I, you know, a lot of my work is parochial, Michael, and uh, forgive me for that, but that, you know, I, I, I come out of this uh, minority community uh, the Jewish community, and I, I have a love-hate relationship with my community as, um, I mean, I adore it in so many ways for the values that it gave me, and yet it's a largely Zionist community, and, and I, I, as my brother's comment about his Jewish newspaper reflects, and um, so that's my area of study, principally, is my community, and what I would say is that um, the hopeful uh, that 95% of the American Jewish community uh, and certainly probably 100% of the organized establishment Jewish community was pro-Zionist since 1967. Uh, that that war that so excited my best friend in elementary school that he came running up to me, totally excited the American Jewish community, got them on Israel's side. And that has been the case for now 50 years, more than 50 years. And 
uh, we're ending that. Uh, activists are ending that. The anti-Zionist community inside the Jewish community is ending that. And Israel is ending that. Israel's unregenerate, right-wing, fascistic, extremist, hateful, ethnic cleansing, apartheid policies against Palestinians is ending that because it's just too well known. And, um, but uh, to get to your point, um, we are beginning to see, and I'm sure it's hammered, it's a hammered, I, I, again, I'm this enthusiast, but I think we're seeing a hemorrhaging of young Jews from uh, the Jewish community over Zionism. And so you have formerly liberal, lib and so we see some liberal Zionists who are speaking out. Peter Beiner has called for one state with equal rights. He's a former liberal Zionist. He used to give um, talks at APAC, the leading Israel lobby uh, right. group to raise money for the Israel lobby. Eric Alterman, long a liberal Zionist, has come out with a book saying that um, Zionism has uh, uh, corrupted American Jewish values. And we've got to divorce ourselves from this uh, support for Israel because you've got, it's just destroying all liberalism and the American Jewish. So we're seeing a process now. And those guys are both in their 50s or 60s. And if you meet young Jews, they are just appalled. I mean, the smart ones are just appalled by Israel's behavior. And um, uh, a quarter, I mean, this is two years ago now that a quarter of Jews said that it's apartheid. I think that number must be a lot higher among young Jews. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, this flip that you keep talking about among Democrats, but also among in the Jewish community, it's really happening with millennials and Gen Zers. I mean, you said it before, they get it. They get it. Yes. Yeah. And I'd say that, I mean, my emphasis on the Jewish community is not just because I'm from that community, but I think that the Jewish community is the most powerful political constituency on this question um, and has determined American foreign policy. Uh, ben Rhodes, the top foreign policy aide to Barack Obama, uh, wrote a book and gave interviews in which he said that um, 10 to 20 uh, uh, representatives of American Jewish organizations were in and out of his office over, I guess, eight years or so, uh, more than anybody else who had an interest in any foreign policy or as much as anybody else on all other foreign policy. So you had these Jewish organizations who had carte blanche at the White House and they had it because of the political contributions of the American Jewish community to the Democratic Party. And uh, so when Obama made the terrible mistake of saying, well, uh, we have to have a two state solution based on the 67 lines, uh, he said it in front of uh, and then Netanyahu lectured him over it. We can never return to the 67 lines or anything near it. Um, ben Rhodes, rather than Obama being able to face down uh, Netanyahu, Ben Rhodes had to call Jewish donors. As he's got, he was given a list of Jewish donors. It was 2011 or so. And he said, here are the list of donors you have to call to make it clear that Obama is not selling out Israel. That um, and so that was in advance of Obama's reelection effort. And right there, the politics are naked. And those politics have been um, determinative, I believe, of American foreign policy, certainly on the Democratic side, and I think also on the Republican side for the last 50 years, if not to 48, when Truman recognized Israel. But uh, I think that, so that's why I focus on that community. And I think that my community is losing power finally. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, if I can offer one other reflection, when I was at college, um, I told you about how a friend told, shut me up about Israel. Well, my college newspaper last year endorsed BDS. And one reason it endorsed BDS is because the numbers of Jews at my college have been when I was there, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% is now down to 5%. And I think that what that reflects is um, there's much greater diversity in the American establishment now than there was 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago even. We're seeing that people of color 
are getting a prominent place in the American establishment at last. And this is having a dramatic effect on the Israel lobby. Um, the people who, uh, you mentioned Andre Carson, he was outside the Capitol today. Elon Omar, uh, Betty McCollum uh, is white, but she's a woman. Um, uh, Elon Omar is a woman of color. So is the wonderful Rashida Tlaib. So we see people of color who understand these issues of racial persecution who are playing a prominent place in changing the discourse. By the time is just shooting by, Phil. Um, I've got a yeah. I'll shut up. No, Sorry. no, no, no. This is this is rich. This is rich. You you live in New York State. Yes. Today's today's Manda Weiss headline: yes. Historic bill would stop New York from subsidizing illegal Israeli settlements. In this article by Michael Aria, quote: The bill to end New York funding of Israeli Settler Violence Act would establish a civil penalty for nonprofits that help fund settlements. The pro-Israel backlash has, predict, has predictably described it as anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, these, these tax exempt charities, right, registered in New York State that give money to uh, these rabid illegal settlement communities, $60 million in tax deductible donations um, uh, every year. So my groups visit places like Tent of Nations and Kanal Amr, uh, under threat by Israeli illegal Israeli settlements. So talk to us more about what what uh, the Attorney General of New York is being petitioned. Well, Michael, my question, I, I want to throw this back at you. How long ago do you remember when you got engaged on this question, people were saying tax deductible money is going to these settlers? How, how long ago did you first hear that? 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? Tell me. I haven't. No, th th this is a relatively new phenomenon for me. Oh, I see. Okay, I should be clear. Uh, 15 years ago, when I first got engaged in this question, 17 years ago, people were saying that these settlers, their groups in the United States that support these settlers. Maybe it's because yeah, I live in yeah, New we, York. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard that, but then the pushback has only been recent. And oh, of course. Oh, yes. No, the, yeah, what yeah. I'm saying is that this has been an issue forever. Right, and right, right. what's great is that we're seeing pushback. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm pointing out that we've known about this. We've sure. known that our tax deductible contributions are supporting these rabid races and there's no accountability. And maybe now there's accountability. It's similar to the fact that um, Israel slaughters people in Gaza with American weapons and the people in Gaza walk around looking at these fragments of these hateful uh, devices and they have USA stamped on them. and uh, Israel has gotten, uh, United States has no accountability for that. And finally, people like Rashida Tlaib and Benny McCollum are saying, guess what? And Bernie Sanders are saying, don't spend our money on persecution of Palestinians. So I see it in that as part of that trend. Well, and uh, our mutual friend, Mark Braverman, just wrote, how about the money? Let me get, Let me bring that back up. How about the money from fundamentalist Christians uh, flowing directly to settler, settler groups? I mean, that's happening as well. I'd like to hear Mark on that point. I think that he's obvious, he's done a lot of work on that. And I, it's, it's not my area of study, but I'd like to hear Mark talk on that. Mark, you want to just give us a minute or so on that? I just asked you to- I'll just, you, you know, what I'll do is I'll put in the chat uh, a, a recent movie that's come out actually by, uh, by young Israeli, uh, uh, movie maker uh, about that. It's, it's pretty shocking and it's very, very hard hitting. Um, so I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I'll, I'll I'll put it in the chat. But this is something that's been going on for a long time. Absolutely. And, and actually, probably the amount of money coming from that source flowing directly to settler groups and probably high levels in the Israeli government are in cahoots as well. It probably makes the the pittance of sixty million dollars flowing in from from New York State and from other private uh, nonprofits uh, makes it look like like a pittance. The, the the Christian money is huge. Thanks for that, Mark. We'll look for that in the chat. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. So, Phil, let me. Uh, um, um, there's many conversations around the world and in this country, uh, in universities, state houses, the federal government, 
UN and other venues about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. It's important, right? I mean, it's important for us to say that uh, anti-Semitism is very real and dangerous, and we, of course, condemn it. I mean, full stop. But talk to us about why this IHRA definition is not the answer. In fact, it itself minimizes if, in, the impact that we can have to battle real anti-Semitism. Talk to us about the IHRA definition. Sure. Um, the IHRA definition is, um, in my view, kind of a hateful definition because it includes, while it includes um, uh, uh, forms of anti-Semitism that we would all recognize, Jew, uh, hatred of Jews and uh, um, threats to Jews, it also includes uh, um, demonizing Israel or trying to delegitimize Israel as the Jewish state, excuse me, or um, the homeland of the Jewish people. And so it includes anti-Zionism as a it, it equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Now, the good news is that the Biden administration has not yet adopted this formally uh, completely uh, IHRA definition. It's under pressure to do so. And I actually anticipate that Biden will do so before the 2024 election to, in order to raise money. But even some liberal Zionists um, have come out against this IHRA definition. And uh, it's just a very bad definition of anti Semitism. If you think that, uh, you know, I spend my days trying to uh, I see my job as trying to delegitimize Zionism. Um, I think that Zionism is a bad is bad for people. It's bad for Jews, and it's much worse for Palestinians. And so I'm not an anti-Semite for that. And I should say just one other reflection on how time changes. I remember when I started work on this, I was walking down the street late at night with a Palestinian uh, who was a grad student. And he said, my goal in life is to end Zionism. It was the middle of the night on Broadway and near Columbia. And the next day I remembered that and I called him up and I said, um, hey man, do you mind if I quote you? I thought it was so amazing to watch you run out into Broadway saying that. He said, are you kidding? I'm a grad student, you're gonna kill my career. I, you can't do that. <laughs> so, I, so I said, sorry, man. So now, I say that openly. My my goal in life is to end Zionism, and many people feel the same way. But according to the IHRA, we're anti-Semites. I, I can't resist an anecdote. Sorry, Michael. Please. Oh yeah, you just gave it. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, you uh, uh, wrote last September in Mondo Weiss that the Roger Waters inspired tour is a cultural high point for Palestine. And we just learned a few weeks ago, right, that he won his legal battle in Germany yeah. to perform in that previously canceled concert in Frankfurt. Talk to us. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Here. Talk sure. to us about the impact of Roger Waters and, and, and then also his impact about the cultural boycott uh, uh, of Israel, because he's had an impact, right, with other performers like Lauren Hill, Snoop Dogg, uh, 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 and, and others. So Sam Smith, that's right, Una, thank you very much. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about cultural boycott and Roger Waters. Well, Roger Waters, as uh, who's a friend and a, uh, uh, has been a friend over the years to many of us, uh, a truly noble, brave figure in this. Uh, um, uh, an artist of great achievement and prominence who was willing to sacrifice his career, uh, if that's what it meant, to support Palestinian rights. Uh, a man of great feeling, uh, uh, he saw the Palestinian conditions when he went out to play in Israel, and he knew that it was unacceptable to support this system. And he's been a leader of the um, getting publicity for our uh, cause ever since. Um, I think the significance is, and Roger is not above berating his former, his fellow musicians, hey, Nick Cave, don't play that place. Um, 
you know, uh, so I think that um, he, he has been very effective in, in promoting cultural boycott of Israel. Now, one thing I want to say is that, and this is again a marker of how things have changed, but cultural boycott, people would say, oh, you why you can't boycott cultures, academics, you have to let the artists come and talk to each other. That's how a society changes. Why, why would you tell an artist not to go to Israel? Well, you know, uh, and, and people were sort of, uh, even left-wingers were, maybe we shouldn't be doing that, you know. But I'd observed that during the recent democracy protests by Israeli secularists, of Zionists, they have said, don't bring your conferences to Israel, your academic conference. You've got to um, uh, uh, choke this government. You've got to starve it. You've got to threaten it economically to bring Netanyahu to his knees. So everything that we have called for in the BDS campaign uh, to, to, to uh, uh, inflict uh, um, the economic, uh, some suffering on this uh, very wealthy society and to make symbolic um, uh, shunnings of it internationally. And, we, um, and we've been called anti-Semitic for supporting BDS. Well, they're saying that now inside the Zionist movement to block the Netanyahu government. So these are tools that any activist recognizes are essential to making progress is uh, cultural boycott, economic boycott. I remember my mother, when we were kids, we wouldn't eat Welsh's grapefruit. A grape juice because Robert Welch was uh, supporting the John Birch Society. So that was economic boycott and cultural boycott. Roger has led that, uh, helped lead that effort. But um, the, the issue for me is that 27 states or so regard BDS as criminal or no, yeah. not criminal, they, they're trying to ban it and it's terrible. And it's, it's helpful to our side because it's so blatantly anti-free speech. You you keep mentioning you've mentioned again and again uh, this flip with especially young Democrats and young Jews, and I I have to believe that much of that is because they in a way that maybe my generation didn't quite do was understand the understand the intersectional uh, uh, characteristic of these various liberation movements that. Uh, if you're anti-racist, you support Palestinian rights. If you're a peace activist, if you're a feminist, if you're an environmentalist, if you're LGBTQ+, if you're a person of color, if you're pro-labor, right, uh, you, you support Palestinian rights. And so many young folks enter into the liberation of Palestine movement through these other uh, activist, uh, activist movements. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, if that's your feeling too, and if that's what uh, um, if that's what you recognize, I think what you're saying is very true. And I imagine there, I wouldn't offer myself as an expert on this because it was something that I was uh, amazed to watch um, this process of the younger generation bringing intersectional values. And I'm sure there are people on these on this call who are leaders on that discussion where I'm a follower. So I hesitate to. Uh, opine on this beyond saying it's been great. And it's what I was saying about the squad in Congress. They're largely women of color. But if there's anyone on the on the call that you think might want to speak to this question, I'd love to hear from them. Well, perhaps they'll offer something in the chat okay. right now because we're just about ready. Sorry, got sorry, sorry, oh, we're just about sorry, ready. We're just about ready to wrap up actually. Right. Okay. Um you're a commentator uh, and an analyst of, of the situation in the U.S. And another reason why maybe uh, um, there's this flip that's happening with Gen Zers and millennials and others, both the United States and Israel, I mean, let, let's just say it, both the U.S. and Israel are settler colonial regime projects. They use the language of democracy as a propaganda tool and they use human rights and justice talk to mask oppressive and violent apartheid and racist uh, projects. So that, I think that too is being recognized that they get it, right? They get that 
we're living in a country itself that is a settler colonial project. That certainly, that discourse has certainly advanced the Palestinian struggle in as much as people have that awareness, it has helped the Palestinian cause in the United States. I agree with you. You, uh, just to connect that question and uh, what you were talking about before, in a webinar with Ali Abu Niba and Nada Aliyah, you said that Zionism is having a discursive collapse. And I think that connects with what we've been talking about here. What did you mean by that? I think that um, that's a fancy way of saying, and I can't imagine. I, uh, I, I'm amazed. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I used that kind of fancy, double-barreled word. It's a dirty word. I think Zionism is a dirty word. And um, apart from my belief, I think that that is beginning to catch on, and people are aware of that. And I think there is going to be. I mean, again, I'm the most hopeful person in the world, but I think among Jews who are the uh, uh, chief ad advocates and adherents of Zionism, they're going to be rushing for the exits and on Zionism because Zionism has been ruined by Israel. If it was ever, it was a, if there was ever uh, a saving grace to Zionism as a liberation movement, it's been completely, uh, its image has been completely destroyed by Israel. And um, liberal Zionist organizations in the United States are already experiencing this uh, um, flood to the exits. Eric Alterman is saying, uh, basically, why would you ever want to be a Zionist if you're a young Jew? And the question then arises, well, Joe Biden's a Zionist. He says he's a Zionist. Um, he's an old uh, American white guy, but how many, uh, that, that discursive collapse, how many Americans, when are Americans going to also be saying, this Zionism thing, I don't want any part of it. You know, this reinforces for me what you just said about Zionism becoming a dirty word. It reinforces for me the parallel nature of Zionism with American exceptionalism. I grew up thinking that American exceptionalism, I mean, this is what I was taught in church, at, in home, in schools, right? American exceptionalism was the reality, was true, was real, was good, you know, and of course, uh, um, we completely reject that today, right? And it be, and that's become a dirty word for many of us. And what, so, what, go ahead. When, what, when did you gain awareness? What would you say were the, the, the stations of the cross for you on that? <laughs> Probably in my uh, uh, early to mid 40s. So I I'm a late bloomer, you know. I came into this uh, liberation movement for the cause of Palestine when I was a, a Fulbrighter working for Prince Hassan in, in Amman, you know, back in 98. Mm, so, mm. Uh, uh, you know, and that's where I met Palestinians and mm. they became uh, radicalized, sensitized first and then radicalized. Wow. And, great, great, um, great description. So it's been, it's been a number of years, you know, but, but Beautiful. much too late though, much too late in my life, but at least it happened. For all of us. Hey, uh, uh, I've got one more question. Sure. And then, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Um, last December, you wrote an article, and you've been referring to yourself this way the entire uh, time today. You wrote an article uh, on Mondo Weiss entitled, I feel hopeful because I see change happening. And then you go on to say, today I see some hope in the American discussion of Palestine. I believe the politics of Palestine are changing in irreversible ways. We can take some credit for that change and look forward to the great shift we've long yearned and prayed for. You still feel that way, obviously. So what get, what continue to tell us what gives you hope and where what are the next steps in this hopeful journey? Well, I think that it's fair to say that I'm one of these guys, again, who at midnight says uh, the dawn's approaching. You know, I, <laughs> I, I am very... Uh, hopeful, uh, and maybe a little ahead of the curve sometimes. That being said, I think we have reached a point in which, again, looking at those democratic numbers, where um, a few years ago, I remember saying, uh, I, there, there was this question that was framed inside the American Jewish community. Um, when, when, when they started being, Zionists started being shunned on campuses, they said, 
you can be progressive and a Zionist, you know, and that was this whole thing. The Jewish community poured money into this and had organizations. You can be progressive and a Zionist. Well, it's 2023. You can't be progressive and a Zionist, okay? You can't. Now, that's my opinion, but it's an opinion that many people share and progressives increasingly share and former liberal Zionists share. And I just think that we've passed, uh, it's, it's, we're all, it, it, we're talking about prediction here. So, you know, predictions are almost always wrong, but I think right now what we're seeing is a moment of such uh, awakening that it's, it's, it's only gonna increase. And we've seen, if you look at the progress curve of things like uh, gay marriage, uh, gay rights, um, even trans rights to some degree, and um, certainly uh, the progress of um, uh, anti-American apartheid stuff since the George Floyd killing, that America does have this capacity, uh, American culture has the capacity to flip and be fluid. And we're all waiting for that moment on Palestine. But certainly you and I and everyone on this call and the groups you mentioned have been doing that work preparing the, the, the ground. And I think that revolution, that true revolution in attitude is, uh, is, gonna, is upon us. What, what, whether it'll have an effect on policy, that's, that's harder point. to say, obviously. That's, but, but I think pro the progressive community is about to experience in that revolution. And then it, there's gotta be a war inside the Democratic Party over this. That's those that may be years off, and the effect on Palestinian life, liberating Palestine. I I, I can't speak to that question because that American policy is very determinative. But first, we've got to change American policy. Well, folks, I I want to give Phil the the last word, but before I do, let me just share this share the screen one more time and thank uh, our co-sponsors for our series, Nakba at 75. And I'll simply remind you that this interview will be on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel by early next week. And I'll be sharing it with each one of these co-sponsors so they can share it with their constituencies. And Phil has assured me that they'll be sharing it at Mondo Weiss as well yeah we will so thank you for the co-sponsors and uh phil any parting words for us my parting words are just a deep gratitude to you for the generosity of your questions uh the the amount of time you've given me to blather uh and uh the 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 uh the audience you've given me i greatly appreciate i just want to honor the fact that um i'm one of many and the many people on this call are people whose work I've admired over the years, including Mark. I saw Priscilla Reed there earlier. I just, you know, this has been a, an amazing, just this has been the most important work of my life. And it's been that way because I've been involved with so many serious, thoughtful teachers. And um, I just feel deep gratitude that uh, um, for all my flaws, I've been accepted as a, uh, as a co-leader in, in among many leaders in this uh, work. So thank you, Michael, and thank you to all of you. Well, you know, you're, you're right, Phil, that you look around the screen at the people who are here, and many of them are people who have been mentors for me and uh, models for courage. And um, so we're, we're grateful, of course, to you, Phil, and to Mondo Weiss Thanks. and your whole team, right? Your whole mm -hmm. team for many years, but we're also grateful for the assembled gathering here because uh, you and I and all of us are one of many working together in this, uh, in this uh, just and righteous cause. So um, Phil, thank you very much. Thank you everyone. And look, we'll uh, look forward to getting this interview out to you soon.